Now, we've seen him here, we've known him, we've heard of him. But one thing that really stands out above the rest that I'll say briefly is that Elder is a Christian and a man who loves God. I believe that sums up everything. At the end of the day, it will not be about the position he held, neither will it be about the roles that he played, but at the end of the day is, what did you do with that which I gave you? And God has given him a privilege to serve as the Chief Justice and the President of the Supreme Court of Kenya from the year 2016 to the year 2021, during which period he also served as the Chairman of the Kenya Judicial Service Commission. Before that, he also managed to serve as the Chairman of the National Council on Administration of Justice and Chairman of the Council of Law Reporting prior to joining the judiciary where he engaged in private practice for 25 years. It's interesting that I get to introduce my sin in the profession and looking at the number of years that he has practiced prior to joining the judiciary, I'm yet even to attain half of that. Having been appointed a judge of the High Court in 2003, he went on to be elevated to be a judge of the Court of Appeal in the year 2012, and he has served as a judge of the three superior courts for a period of 18 years. Elder is a person who celebrated not within the borders, but also internationally, having been invited as a keynote speaker in various forums. And in recognition of this service, he's received many awards, including the International Commission of Jurists, ICJ, Jurist of the Year in the year 2017, CB made an award, the LSK Award for Distinguished Service in the Administration of Justice, and in the year 2016, the head of state then honored him with a state honor, Elder of the Golden Heart, EGH, for his exemplary service to the nation. Between May and November of 2021, he chaired a team of nine expert reference group consultants that had been engaged by the UNDP to advise on its re-imagining governance and peace building in Africa. This was a consultative process whose objective was to articulate issues of governance and peace building framework to guide UNDP's Africa program for the year 2022 to 2025. Finally, but not least, if you're very keen in the news, I believe this was on Thursday, if I'm not wrong, having been appointed the chairman of the task force uh, nominated by His Excellency the President William Ruto, the task force had been tasked with the role of improvement of the terms and conditions of the service for the members of the National Police Service, the Kenya Prison Service, and the National Youth Service, which report I believe, going by the news and the photos, they submitted the report, having done and delivered on the task. Finally, he's an accomplished academia, holding a master's in uh, law, uh, democracy and governance. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in London and a recipient of an honorary degree from Desta University, AUA as well as Andrews University in Michigan, all in recognition of his distinguished service and courageous leadership. And all this is possible because he loves and fears God. Amen? Elder, please come and speak to the members present and also those who will follow this session online afterwards. Let's be keen, and as he comes, there will be a paper going round uh, you can scan the QR code and register uh, yourself into the Young Professionals Forum. God bless you all. Elder Karibu. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, and uh, the Council of uh, the young professionals for the invite to come and speak to you. 
the invite came in a way even if I wanted to refuse I could not not that I wanted to refuse but it was brought in a way that I could not refuse my son being a member of the council brought the invitation and here I am we thank God for the this program I am happy to note that uh, you have come up with a program like this during our days at your age we didn't have such a fora we didn't have such a programs I guess it's because the times you live in at the moment are diametrically different from our times and uh, with the with the communication, it is now uh, easy to engage in quite a number of uh, discussions and presentations. I'm happy to note that uh, you have had a, a series of uh, mentorship uh, talks by people I have great respect for, and I'm sure you benefited a lot. You have had uh, talks on what uh, marriage life is all about. You have had uh, talks about interview tips. You have had uh, talks about HR challenges, especially in this time of technology, in our places of work. I was requested to speak on legal practice generally and how a Christian lawyer can serve with integrity. I, with that in mind, of course, uh, I, I, I decided that um, perhaps first things first. First things first, so that uh, I lay some kind of foundation, some kind of foundation in the hope and you can see now I'm asking for a further invitation to come back and now speak on the, in, in detail on uh, the legal practice with integrity. Why have I uh, uh, decided to go that way? I've decided to go that way because in uh, legal practice, just like any other professional practice, there are fundamental uh, principles that govern that, particularly when it is by a Christian. So it is important that we understand those foundational aspects of our legal practice. This afternoon or evening, I want to speak about the the foundation of the legal practice with integrity, and in my view, this is what I've entitled What Matters in Life. What Matters in Life. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, King of the Universe, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity you've given us to meditate upon your word. Eternal Father, you have taught us that we are in this world, but not of this world, so that as we go on with our work, which you want us to go on with, because you have told us that we should work, we should work as children of the kingdom. As we have this discussion this afternoon, I pray that you control our faculties, and let everything we do give honor and glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What matters in life? If I pose that question and ask all of you to answer, I will uh, get uh, varied answers. Some, some people say a question like that is relative. Relative to uh, how you look at life. As Christians, however, 
there are matters which rank quite high on our lists of what matters in life. For me, what matters most in life is knowing and always focusing on the big picture. The big picture. And what is this big picture? The big, big picture for us as Christians is to understand the great controversy between Christ and Satan, the great controversy between good and evil, and deciding on which side you want to be in. What matters most in life is knowing that you cannot be in both sides. You cannot be in both sides. You are either for Christ or you are for Satan. And the decision to be on, on Christ's side is not a mere mental exercise. You just don't say, I am on Christ's side. Important as that is, and say that is enough. What matters in life is to know that is to know how the great controversy is playing out in our lives. The great controversy is a battle of wits. It's a battle for the capture of our minds. Satan is using means that Christ cannot use. Satan is using deception. Satan comes up with various schemes, one of which is to tell us that, that we should not be serious with life. You've heard people say, uh, you live once, enjoy your life. Sure, sure, we live once, enjoy, enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with that. But in do, so doing, Satan wants us to lose focus. Satan does not want us to be on our guard. And when you are, if you are not, if you I mean, um, lose a bit, he will trip you. He will trip you and you will fall. So what does he do? He uses all means to dull, even to dull our senses, to keep us not focused and to be involved in other things. I remember vividly something which has never gone out of my mind. I think it was around 1983 or 84, there was a Catholic bishop who used to write a column in the Standard, Thought for Sunday. The old uh, people may, may know about that. One Sunday he wrote something that caught my attention. He says, the devil and his, 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 his team, his, his angels, came together and said, look, we are losing the battle to Christ. What do we do? We are losing ground. They discussed about how they are losing ground. And some came up, one, one, one of them came up with an idea and they said, look, why don't we go and tell the Christians that this story you are being told about Christ is a hoax. Christ is not even there. They discussed and said, no, 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 this is documented. There's no way anybody can buy anything like that. Then they said, okay, fine. Let's go and tell them that the story you are being told about Jesus coming is a hoax. It is not Jesus who came, it is somebody else. He says, no, no, no. They said, no, that one they will not buy. Another one came, went and said, okay, Jesus came, but he's not coming back. They discussed that and they dismissed it also. Then one last one came and said, fine, I have a brilliant idea. Let's go and tell them Jesus is real. Jesus came, Jesus will come back, but not yet, there is time. They all clubbed and said, yes, that one they will buy, that one they will buy. So we will lull them 
to do what uh, we want them to do so that they can lose a focus. Uh, and we get them. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because the devil wants to us to lose focus. And he is particularly focused on the young people, the young professionals, yourselves and many others. Why? Because you are in the prime of your lives. Because you are the future of our church. Because you are the future of our nation. If the devil succeeds to trip you and get you, for example, into alcohol, he would have not only ruined you, but he would have also ruined your family. He would have succeeded in ruining your family as well. This is why the Apostle Peter is warning us in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. He says, Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks with about like a rolling lion seeking whom he may differ. The devil is finding every opportunity to make sure that he, de he derails you and he, he throws you off balance. We live as we study from prophecy. In the very end of this world is history. We are, as, as it were, very, very close to the finishing line. You know uh, that if you, if you are in athletics and you are, you, are, you are sprinting, if you lose focus for even a few seconds, you will, you will lose, you will not get the prize. So if we miss the point, the devil is going to delay us. If you ask professors, and quite a number of them uh, could be here, they will tell you that quite a number of students fail not because they are stupid, because they misread or don't understand the questions that are asked. That is what the devil wants us uh, to do. He wants us to uh, lose focus and then he will, he will drain us. In this scenario, what matters in life is, is to know who we are. Who we are and what is expected of us. I want to ask you, who are you? Who am I? Who are we? What matters in life is to know that as Christians, we are sons and daughters of the living God. In the book of Exodus 19 verse 5, Exodus 19 verse 5 and uh, 1 Peter 2 uh, verse 9, and I'm paraphrasing here, they say that you are a special treasure to God above all people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a, a holy nation. That's how Christ regards us. In other words, we are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. We are princes and princesses. Princes and princesses in that kind of uh, position. We are required to have even a behavior uh, code. You are supposed to have even a dress code different and befitting of princes, princes and, 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 and princesses. In the great controversy, if you are for Christ, the Bible says, but seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. Which things? Which things? 
Let us understand the context in which uh, uh, this statement was made. If you read the book of Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 1, all through to Matthew 8, verse 1, and Luke 6, verse 17 to 49, you will find the record of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Christ's inaugural address delivered probably in late uh, summer of AD 29. About midway of the three and a half year ministry of Christ on earth. At this time, Christ had just appointed his 12 apostles because of the work that he saw that required more, more hands. The Sermon on the Mount, in the Sermon of the, of, on the Mount, as the King of the Kingdom of Greece, or the Kingdom of Heaven, Christ set forth conditions of citizenship, proclaimed the law, and delineated the objectives of the Kingdom of Heaven. Every nation, every organization, in fact, if you want to form an organization of even about 10 people, and you go to the registrar of uh, business names, it will require you to go with a constitution. What are the rules governing uh, your organization? Christ, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, said the, 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 the terms, the conditions, and also the law that is going to govern the kingdom of grace. The purpose, if you read through that from the commentaries, it says the purpose in man's existence is that he should seek the Lord if happily he might feel and find him. Most men are engrossed in laboring for the meat which perisheth, for the water which when you drink you will get thirsty again. Most men spend money for that which is not bread and labor for what doesn't satisfy. Too often, we are prone to make all these material things the object of our search in life in the vain hope that God will be indulgent with us and at the close of life's journey add to our span of life the eternal kingdom. Christ would have us make first things first. This is why I said this. We must have our priorities right. First things first. And assures us that if we seek first the kingdom of heaven, all these material uh, requirements, all these material needs will be supplied in accordance with the need of each of us. There is no such a thing as a security apart from God and the citizenship of his kingdom. The best cure for worry is trust in God. If we do our part faithfully, if we make the kingdom of heaven fast in our thoughts and lives, God will take care of us through the work of our life. He will graciously anoint our heads with the oil and our cup of experience will overflow in the good things. This is from the commentaries, the SDA commentaries. Uh, volume 5, has, I mean page 352. Young people, you are our children. You have gone to school. You have done well. You have done us proud. You are young professionals. You are the pride of our church. We are all very proud of you. You are seeking to be successful in your careers and lead a good life. 
That's what we are praying for you. That's our prayer for you. As our children, that's our prayer for you. We want you to live uh, in good places. We want you to drive good cars. But at the end of the journey, at the end of your journey, what will matter in your life will be whether or not your name is in the, in the book of life for entry into the kingdom of God. For entry into the kingdom of God. You know, I have, uh, and, and I will give you a few experiences. We have people who have gone round, who have had um, a life, and they have come to the end of their life as it were. They look back and ask themselves, what have I achieved? One time I can remember, I think this was in the early 90s, I had a case, I was in private practice, I had a case in Kisi with a lead lawyer who was practicing in Akuru. We were together in Akuru. And we had this case in, in, in Kisi. He was on the other side, I was on, on this side. She asked me to give her a lift, which I agreed. And we agreed, we meet at six o'clock at a petrol station in Akuru. I went there and waited and she, she didn't come. By seven o'clock, she had not come. And, and you know, I, we had to make it to Kisi by nine o'clock. Those days, there were no mobile phones. So I didn't know what had happened. I drove to Kisi. I went and told the judge, look, uh, judge, I don't want to take advantage of my colleague's absence. I was supposed to give her a lift. We were supposed to meet. I went and waited for her. She didn't come. From the way I know her, something must have happened to stop her. In short, I applied for adjournment for uh, my colleague. I, are you seeing that? Sometimes a few things, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know how to put them because you, you appear to be praising yourself. I, I didn't want to take advantage of her absence. I would have taken advantage of, of her absence. I said, look, I don't know what has happened. I don't know. And I would have had her case dismissed. I said, no, that is not right. So I, 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 I had joined the case and went back to Nakuru. The following day, she came to my office and told me, Mr. Maraga, I'm sorry I kept to you, but there's no way I could communicate with you. My son felt very sick at night. My son very, very sick at night. He didn't sleep until around 3 a.m. So when I woke up at 6, I, I could not be sure he was well. And that's why I could not come. I understood that straight away. I understood that straight away. No parent uh, could go and leave a sick child behind like that one. But this lady made a statement which struck me. He says, you, you know, if, if it does not matter what position you occupy, if you have no family, if you have no family, it is as though your life is futile. Is, it, is that not a fact? Is that not a fact? At the end of my life, and I'm getting to 73, at the end of my life, I will look back and say, what family have I brought up? Whose life have I touched? What have I accomplished? Forget about my, my academic achievement, my work and what, but in that work, have I touched anybody's life in a positive way that it will 
enable that person to move forward. At the end of your careers, at the end of your professional careers, whether you like it or not, you will come to ask yourself those kind of questions. If you are a serious person and you, have, uh, you care, I want to ask you, I want to plead with you that get your priorities right. Get your priorities right. In your professional career, you need to get your priorities right. We know some of you have no jobs. That you can ask me how many please, tearful please, I receive every day about young people who have no jobs. You know, sometimes you feel like crying with them because they, you, you, are, you are also helpless. We are praying for you that God will open a way for you to get something. But as you, you look for jobs, you are a professional. I want you to think about what you can do. I want you to think about what you can do. You are not just going to see title. You are an engineer. You are a lawyer. You are a business consultant. You are looking for a job and nothing has come yet. Don't just sit there. Think about what you can do. With innovation, with innovation and the prayerful innovation, you know you could easily turn out to be an employer yourself. You don't need employment, you are an employer yourself, and you can uh, do that. Last Sunday, I launched a business for a young Adventist in Sarit Center. Some of you may have seen it in the media. I have that young man's permission to say this. This is a young man I found extremely focused. The last time I spoke in his church, that's about a year, a year ago, I spoke and I said, look, you, you people, some of you have no jobs, some of you have challenges here and there. Put your challenges to God and pray. Don't limit God and pray. This young man asked me a question. He had challenges keeping his faith. He had challenges living out his faith. He had challenges especially keeping the Sabbath in the work where he was. When we discussed, I told him, young man, with this, this one, you need to make up your mind. Walk out of that place and trust that God will find something for you. He took up the challenge and he, he, he resigned. Then he decided to do some business. He went to Sarit Center. There was an exhibition he was doing there. And somehow, he caught the attention of uh, some foreigners. He caught the attention of uh, Sarit Center Management. The MD or the Chief Executive of Sarit Center told him, look, I want you here. Come and set off your business here. He has been there for some time. From the look of things, he is headed for great things. He is a happy man. He can worship on Sabbath without any challenge. And he trusts in God. He tells me that he trusts in God. I have no doubt myself that having honored God, having honored God, God is not going to let him down. I want you uh, people to think about what you do in your provisions. 
Some of you are in employment and in, even in managerial positions, and we thank God for you. Some of you are in middle, middle level uh, positions. Whatever positions you are, I know there are challenges. Some of them re re relating to me me meeting deadlines. As you think of your great assignments, as you think about your success, ask yourself, as you do these things, how does what you do honor and glorify God? That's the number one thing. That's the first thing that you should think about. How does what you do honor and give glory to God? At the times, you may even find your employer asking you to do something wrong. I've been told that many times. Something sinful. Maybe he wants, if you are an accountant, he wants you to falsify the records. He wants you to, to do things which are not straight, to cut corners. These are all challenges on your integrity on your integrity. And this is where I want to ask you to stand for Christ. Stand up and be counted for Christ. You are not going to stand up in vain. God is going to see that. Sacred history presents many noble examples of men whose characters have been modeled, whose characters have been built under divine direction. Men whose lives have been a blessing to their fellow men and who have stood up as representatives of God of the universe. Among these people are Joseph and Daniel, Moses, Elisha, and Paul. These are great statesmen. Moses was the wisest legislator. One of the most uh, faithful reformers was Elisha. And except for Christ, Paul was the most illustrious teacher that the world has ever known. I want you to think about these examples. These examples are not written there for just for nothing. If you honor God, God will honor you in this life and in the life to come. And please listen to me. God will honor you and lift you and give you success in this life and in the life to come. It will not be a walk in the park. It will not be a walk in the park. Some of the challenges that will be there, God will allow them to even refine you more and to make, get you to be even better. The story of, 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 of the, this, I mean, heroes of the Bible have given, you know it, but it's good to, re, to remind ourselves. None of these people knew what was in store for them. The secret of their success lay in their unwavering trust in God they chose to seek first the kingdom of heaven. They were not an extraordinary people. They were like you and me. The only difference, perhaps, is that they were steadfast. They were steadfast, and that is how they, have, uh, they succeeded. If you didn't know, no one can stand upon a lofty height without the danger. When you are in a high position, there are very many challenges that come with that. You will ask me about that sometimes back and I will tell you. I was not in a very high position, but I was in a fairly high position. And I can tell you the challenges that go with a position like that. In other words, if you are high in your position, as I said, some of you are managers, 
there are very many challenges come, which come your way. Some, some of them which can even uh, derail you and make you to compromise. Because these heroes stood by God, they chose to be on, God, on Christ's side in the great controversy. Christ stood with them. Christ stood with them. If you read the Bible carefully, when the three uh, young Hebrews were walking in the furnace, Christ was walking with them in the furnace. He was not sitting. He was walking with them in the furnace. When Stephen was being stoned to death, he looked up and saw Christ on his standing from his seat in the heavenly temple. Christ stood for Stephen. He didn't just watch seated. He stood. That tells you uh, of the endorsement Christ made because of uh, Stephen. You know the story of Joseph. When Joseph was on his way to slavery, when Joseph was on his way to slavery, he remembered that the God of his, his father, his father Jacob had told him about God and the marvelous things God had done in Jacob's life. Joseph resolved on the way, he resolved on the way that he is going to honor God, he is going to stand by God and according to him, he knew what was going to, to, to be with him. With that resolution, you know the rest of the story. Joseph was tempted with Potiphar's wife. He won. He went into prison for uh, several years. From there, God raised him to be the prime minister of Egypt, the most powerful uh, kingdom then. This life. Is that not so? In this life, he raised him to that position. You know the story of Daniel. Honoring God from small things like even the diet. The food which had already been offered to idols. He said he would not eat that. He stood firm. He was even thrown into the den of lions. God honored him and they got him out of, of there. Is that not what uh, we read from 1 Samuel 2, verse, uh, verse 30? He says, God says, those who honor him, he will honor them. Elisha is one character, I mean, the Bible says, who was faithful in little things. When he was called to the ministry, he was plowing with the with, the, with, the, with his father's servants. I could imagine him holding the plow in that dusty uh, uh, ground. Elisha didn't uh, say, look, this is the work of, uh, of our workers. I should not go there. He went there and worked. I want to ask you young people. You can see very many ladies here. How many of you got with your moms to the kitchen to wash the, 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 the plates? Especially when you have had visitors. The greasy, those greasy plates. How many of you go with your mom? How many of you go, thank you very much. How many of you go with your mom and cook? And cook? Great. Thank you very much. Those little things, because, I, I mean, within a short while, if you, have, if, you have not, if you are not yet married, within a short while, you will get out of your parents' home, isn't it? You will go there running your home. 
I, I can come and I can decide and tell you, eh, Evelyn, I'm coming to your home this evening for dinner. You don't know even how to cook ugali. I love ugali. You will go fritting. Little, little uh, things. Elisha did that. And he was appointed to take over from Elisha. And you know what he asked for? When Elisha was uh, about to be translated, he asked Elisha, Elisha what he wanted to give him. And he said, give me a double portion. Ask God to give me a double portion of the spirit which is in you. And he was given. He had crossed the river Jordan to the other side. And they wanted to go back. With the mantle that had fallen from Elijah's, uh, Elijah's hands when he was taken up, he got all of it and they struck the river. And the river parted. River Jordan parted. Where Joshua had struck it and it parted, Elisha struck it and it parted. What a great honor for that young man. And he did very many things. You know the story of Moses? The prince in, the, in, the, in, the, in Egypt, one who was headed for, uh, for the leadership of Egypt, he chose to be with the, the slaves, to lead the life of slaves. Moses' story has been read the whole world for generations and generations, and it will continue being read until Christ comes back. What a great honor in this, on this word. Moses himself is in heaven. We know that. You know that. Eh? So this, this, these are people who have been here. For Paul, he has said very many things. He says he considers everything in this world nothing that can stand in his way than to gain the kingdom of heaven. These people were honored by God in this life. Other than Moses, who we are told was resurrected and is in heaven, the others are sleeping, awaiting uh, the resurrection morning. Their names are in the book of life. My prayer for you is that as you discharge your duties, you be there in the, your name be there in the book of heaven. We talk about integrity, and when you talk about integrity, and I'm sure you have read this, Ellen G. White's statement in the book of uh, education springs to mind. The greatest want of the world, I've used this many, 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 many times, and I'm sure you have as well. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their innermost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall down. That's not, she doesn't stop there. She says, but such a character is not the result of accident. Such a character will not come by accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. God is not going to be uh, partial and give others uh, endowments they don't deserve. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of subjection, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God and to man. Self-discipline, getting your priorities right, subject the lower to the higher. The world has challenges today. 
And I keep telling uh, people, we are not going to miss to heaven, to go to heaven, because we are going to be involved in, the, in the robberies with violence. Because we are going to murder. That's not what is going to stop us from going to heaven. What is going to stop us from going to heaven is carelessness. Carelessness. So casual in our lives that we don't realize what is important. We don't get to be focused on Christ. You know what the book of Revelation chapter 3 says? God is speaking about the Laodicean church. If you are not warm, you are lukewarm, you are already on, on certain side. That is what is going to stop us from going to heaven, most of us. Just casual. We hold, I mean, life uh, so casually, and we are going to be, uh, to, to be stopped from heaven. But if we are focused, Christ says in the book of Matthew 10, verse 32, Therefore, whoever converses me before men, him I will also converse before my Father in heaven. You will hear some people talking about uh, working smart. That in these days you don't need to work hard. You need to work smart. You know what that means. It's actually corruption. You want to get a good car? You don't need to struggle. You just work smart. Find a way of, uh, of, of doing things. And you get money to, to buy what you want. You will see somebody driving a very good car. You don't know how, how, how long that person has worked. You don't know his fortunes. Maybe you know he has, he, has, he has gotten that not through very honest means, and you also desire that. When I was in private practice, and I was in private practice for a, a very long time, before I bought a, a new car, brand new from the, the showroom. When I bought it and I, I found some young lawyers saying, hey, senior, you bought a very good car. I said, yeah, this is good. Uh, I could see they admired the car. A Subaru Legacy, not the one Moses has, an earlier one. Soon after that, some of them, I saw one of them had a Mercedes uh, 320. Second hand, okay, but it's a Mercedes. You should, uh, I don't want to tell you <laughs> the experiences he was, he was going through. Huh? In short, he was, uh, he was a visitor in some places uh, quite often, quite often. You don't know, I mean, this young man wants to buy a car like me, and I had been in private practice for, for more than 15 years. More than 15 years, and I chose to, to, to buy a new car and drive myself. The Bible says, don't envy the wicked. And that's where we make a mistake. Don't envy the wicked. You've just joined the profession. You don't get your priorities right. You don't get your priorities right. As I said, it is good you, you lead a good life. Lead a good life. But in that life, make sure you honor God. Make sure God is glorified in what you do. For if you don't, at the end of your life's journey, you will say like the wisest man who ever lived, that all is vanity. Vanity of vanities. Vanity of vanities. Solomon got, got time to repent. 
you may not get that time to repent. When you have ruined your life, when your name is not in the kingdom of heaven, when you have been involved in things that are, 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 are not right before God. God promises to raise his children to the top are there for you and me. If you choose to honor God, God will raise you up. I have said this a lot, and it is in the public media. When I was being interviewed for the position of Chief Justice, I was asked a question that I could not evade. For those of you who don't know, the presidential petition has to be decided within 14 days, 14 calendar days, not 14 working days, 14 calendar days. That includes Saturday and uh, Sunday. Then one commissioner asked me and said, yes, we know you are an Adventist. What are you going to do uh, if one of those days falls on, the, on Saturday? In that split of a second, I made up my mind that if this is what is going to give me the job, let it be. That, that job can stay. That is, I, I made up that my, my, my mind. I told him, look, I will speak with the judges to accommodate me so that we, we don't sit on, the, on Sabbath. And sure enough, the first day of hearing fell on the, on the Sabbath. <laughs> and I spoke to my, that time when I was telling uh, the, the, the interviewers, I didn't know what was going to happen. The first day of sitting fell on Sabbath. You know what happened? And, and I was now thinking how I'm going to, and I was asking, I started with my deputy. I said, look, how will you accommodate me? She's a Catholic. I said, I mean, what, what? Let me say this. <laughs> she's a Catholic, and she said, look, but I hear you SDA say, that your day starts at uh, 6, 6, 6.30. I said, yes. And the rest of us, the day starts at midnight, which means Saturday, for the rest of us, Saturday will still, at 7 on Saturday evening, will be still Saturday. Are, are you seeing? Will be still Saturday, but for you it is what? It is already Sunday. I said, I, I thanked God in my, in my prayer, and I said, God, you have answered my problem. You have answered my, my, my prayer. I, talk with, I talked with the other judges, and we arranged the sitting at 7, 7 p.m. of Saturday evening. And we sat, and, the, and we, we went on. You see how God works his own things? I made up my mind that if I was going to be asked to work on the Sabbath, that job could stay. The rest is history. And if, you, if I were to sit with you and tell you how God held my hand, through and through and through to the end, I can never praise him enough. I can never praise him enough. The promises given to, or the, the, the promises God gave to Daniel, to Joseph, to Moses, to Paul, to Elisha, and many heroes, those promises are there for you and me today. That's why I was, I was, I was, I was able to, to God, God held my hand through and through. God does not change. I want you people to know 
that you are going to succeed in your provisions if you put God first. If in whatever you do, you ask yourself, how is God going to be honored in this? If it is going to be dishonorable, let it stay. It doesn't matter whether uh, you are going to lose that job. God is not limited. God is not limited. In most cases, it's because we don't trust. It's because of our little faith. And as a result of that, we do things that we are not required to do. We sin. We compromise on our faith. We don't leave our faith. And as a result, we lose. Let me tell you, if somebody uh, asks you to do wrong things, for example, if somebody wants, you are the type, you are the person without whose signature some money cannot be stolen and you sign, that person gets his card. After he has gotten his card, he will have very, very little regard of you. He will have very, very little regard of you. If somebody were to ask him, Something where he is most interested to nominate somebody of integrity, he will not nominate you. The same person who has asked you to do, to do those things. But if you do what is right, somebody will not like you. Somebody will not like you. But come, <laughs> I mean, to a point where somebody who, who is honest is required and that person is honest, he will nominate you. He will nominate you. Stand for Christ, and the people will respect you. You will not be the richest in this world, but you will not go hungry. Your family will not go hungry. Your children will go to school. Your children will go to school. You go uh, involving yourself in corruption. You send your children to school. They will come back drug peddlers. What has it profited you? There are some things when you, when, you, when you put yourself in God's way, he takes care of. He takes care of. We, parents here, our children, get out of our hands from the year 12, isn't it? From year 12. Year 12 above, our children have gone, they have gone either to secondary schools or they have gone to, to universities where you have, no, you, have, you have no control over them. If you have not placed them in God's hands when they were young, you have lost them. You have lost them. My prayer this evening as young people is that get the first things first. Get grounded on the word of God. Seek to honor God in whatever you do, and God will honor you. God will honor you. In this life and in the life to come. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Elder Maraga, the CJ Emeritus. I'd say a big amen to him. We thank God for the wise words and counsel. And just let me take it through once more. Six things that he has clearly pointed out. One, he knew or he knows the bigger picture. This being the great controversy and how it plays out in our lives. Number two, who we are and what is expected of us. That is a question that we ought to ask ourselves, both in our spiritual life and in our workplaces. Forgetting not that we are royal priesthood, a chosen generation called upon to seek first God's kingdom. Number three, let's get our priorities right at the workplaces. It reminds me of what my grandmother once said to us whenever we go home to visit, and it reminds us to be faithful stewards of time. And our words are very clear and they ring loud in our heads that when you go to work, do not steal from the employer. And stealing doesn't take the financial aspect. She's very specific on matters time. If you're called upon to report to work at 10, let it be 10. 
and not at 11. So let's get our priorities right at our workplaces. Then let's subject the lower to the highest, the highest being God in heaven. Don't envy the wicked. Easy come, easy go. The wicked may seem to prosper, but their days are numbered. And finally, but not least, honor God, and he will lift you up. At this point, I believe after you know, him having spoken, we could be having questions uh, to him, points of clarification. So there is a mic that is going around. Let me see by a show of hand, anyone who has a question. Yes, there is one there. There is a gentleman there. We keep it brief, straight to the point. In our feature today, there is a, a high life and a low life. Uh, if I consider you as uh, maybe a, a faithful Adventist uh, that uh, works in a, a, a constitutional or a court, and then uh, your faith is high in a way that maybe the Holy Father knows you, not in a human or other people, okay? And then now you want to consider a lower a lower human being and a, a high human being in a way that uh, he doesn't have money, okay? He doesn't have uh, a food, and then he stole, he stole your money. Unfortunately, he stole your money, he found your vehicle parked, and then he said, no, I'm angry, and, and then I don't have money, and this one is a big boss, always touching money, then he stole your money. Then suddenly you react. Satan shake your, he shake your faith. And always be strong in faith. You are singing for us. You are reminding us. Then he stole your money that you are going to use on the shamba. What will be your reaction? Uh, can you tell us your reaction inside the face, inside the faith? Okay, to Elder, maybe I would like you to clarify more to especially resilience to uh, our young professionals because I've seen even in our workplace this a generation which they want everything pop uh, there's not that time to wait so uh, what do you advise them and this feeling like I don't feel this place you are up and gone so the resilience part because it is coming up they are, they are getting so depressed and this is the group which is committing suicide. Mine is, uh, we have the young professions, professionals here. They are seeking for a job. A job has been advertised at um, East African Breweries Limited. Is an Adventist. Um, I w I'm, uh, I'm requesting that you advise them. Number two, we have uh, lawyers here, young lawyers. A client has come to you, he has committed murder, he has told you the truth. Uh, how, how do we go about it? Because uh, we want to, to put things right. We don't want to be careless, because the small things will make us not to go to heaven. Number three, we have a shop. You, you, you have a shop, you are selling um, tea leaves, you are selling cigarettes, and maybe you have an hotel that is uh, selling the, the beers and that. These are the challenges that we have, and we need to put things right because we are preparing to go to heaven. Thank you. Well, you like, I'd like you to tell us if you grew up in, in the SDA church because for, for me, I, I think that sometimes desperation pushes you to places you don't want to go. Well, I've been to a point where I was desperate. Thank God he took me out of that uh, situation. But for young people who've looked for work, of course they've done all they can. They've knocked on doors, they've sent emails, and they can't get work, say, three years down the line. They've been really, really struggling. Finally, they get a job that uh, requires them to work on Sabbath. They're really desperate. Desperate, so... How, how, how do you go about that, especially if you've not been brought out uh, in a strong faith-based family or if you've not come to learn that 
you really need to trust in God uh, regardless, like I did learn. Uh, my question is uh, whether you are considering uh, benefiting us with a biography of your experience in form of a book in the future or maybe in the near present. Thank you. Very interesting and challenging questions. And uh, for me, these are questions, the really life, the really challenges of life that uh, you young people are facing. And, and in fact, we, we all are facing. The first question was by our brother who was saying, subjecting lo the lower to the higher. Somebody has stolen from my, my money, or my, my what? Because he's, he's des desperate, he's angry. You asked me how I will handle that. If this young man came and said, look, here I am. Like if, if you have been caught, here I am, it's because I didn't have anything to eat. And I look at you, and I see that you are actually honest. You didn't have anything to eat. I look at you, and prayerfully I can tell that you are not stealing this money to one and take drugs. Are you with me? Because there are very many people who are desperate to get money for drugs. And they have done many things you would not even think of. If I make up my mind that you are not in that class, I will, in fact, if anything, if I have something more, I will give you. I will give you, uh, because this is our challenge. And then, advise you of something you can do, because you are not going to continue stealing, because you, you don't have something to eat, you continue stealing so that you, you, you earn a living from there. I would advise you that somebody is going to even uh, uh, kick you or hit you very hard, and uh, you could easily, you, you easily die. Frida, you asked a very interesting question of young people who are in, uh, in a hurry to get things uh, very quickly. And quite a number of you young people are in that uh, um, state. That's where God wants you to make a difference. God wants you to make a difference. There is what we call deferred gratification. Deferred gratification. If you are in a hurry to get things, that's why I said, this young man saw me driving a new car. He has just from, come from university like two years before, I have been there for more than 15 years. I've bought a new car. He says he also wants a, a car. And they actually to like tell me, look, you only bought a Subaru, I have a Mercedes. Defat, uh, I mean gratification. Get your priorities right. What matters in life? If you didn't buy this car, would you not uh, go on with your work? Would you not pro prosper? Maybe you have children. Who, who, who need food, who need to go to school. You're not going to buy a car and your children have no food to eat. Deferred gratification, and that's what we advise uh, young people. And let some things move on. Get your priorities right. Things like the uh, cars are a thing. I have even seen young people, uh, sorry, if you fall in any of that, those categories, You've just been employed and you want a smartphone. You want an iPhone like Maragas. Eh? <laughs> you, you <laughs> an iPhone which, which, which even two, two months of your salary will not buy. Eh? And, and you are desperate and then you go into depression because of that. Those are things you need to get your priorities right. That's why I said you get your priorities right. Jeruto, you've been given a job with Kenya Breweries.
Do you work for them or do you not work for them? A very personal question. And I will tell you that because there are some people uh, who work for farms like those. It, it again also depends on what you are doing. You could be doing, you would not be in sales or things like that. And it is something you need to think very, very seriously. If you decided against it, God is going to notice that. God is going to notice that. You have asked me, as a lawyer, whether I can defend a murderer. I have done that. I have done that. You sit with that person, find out why he has murdered. You could easily find it is what we call manslaughter. 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 In the spa of the moment, somebody in the spa of the moment eh, is annoyed and he has, he has struck another one and he is, he is dead. In fact, such a people run even to the police station and say, what have I done? That kind of person requires to be defended and so that his case can be put, so that his case can be put to court. These are the circumstances which led this person to do this. He didn't intend to murder. He, he, I mean, this is what happened. One time, I was defending a young man who shot somebody on the foot, and the bullet was lodged in his, in his bone. I asked him what happened. He told me they were, they were, they, they, they were arguing over something. And in that, in that kind of confusion, he shot him. He was very, very remorseful. I told him, there is nothing to defend you here. Let's go to court and you, I will tell the court you shot him. In any case, that one you can't escape. The police have proved that it is your gun which shot him, and they have evidence to that. I went to court, and I pleaded with, uh, with him for him. I said, this young man, in the course of an argument, he used his gun, he is remorseful. He is in your hands. And you know what happened? The magistrate gave him a fine instead of sending him to prison. Sending him to prison, he would have lost his job. That's, that's being honest. I was very honest, and I, my mind was very clear. This young man uh, uh, shot, and, and he caused, he caused uh, injury to somebody else. As lawyers, that's what we are supposed to do, to be honest and tell the court what has happened. Then the rest of the things you leave to the court. A shopkeeper, you are, uh, you, you are having a, a shop with varied goods, including uh, beer. An Adventist, you will exclude beer. The business you will get from, uh, from the beer, eh? God will, 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 will compensate you in a different way. As an Adventist, we are not supposed to sell tobacco. You can't sell beer. You can't do that. Because if you're selling to people, that's as good as, uh, as, 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 as giving them to drink themselves. So that, those are the, among the questions you, that you, you want to act. There are some questions which were given to me here. Yes, the question I've been, <laughs> I've been asked here is, uh, 2017, the president said he would revisit. <laughs> Did I fear? <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting question. By the way, that, that period, that period, if there's a time I slept peacefully, it is that time. And I mean it, and I mean it, because of your prayers. You know, literally, the whole country was praying for me. 
not just the Adventist world, the whole country was praying for me. If there is a period I slept soundly, it is during that period. God has his own way of uh, doing things. He has asked me that, uh, that I, mean, I mean, in my office, I invited pastors to pray for me. Of course, those prayers are what carried me all the way up to, to the end. And I thank those pastors who came. I thank those pastors who, who came. When I took office immediately, before I sat on my seat, I invited Pastor Ruguri. Ruguri was in state house when I was sworn. He came and we prayed in my office. He consecrated that office to, to God's own and glory. And God worked miracles through those prayers. When I ended, I invited Pastor Makuri. Makuri thanked God in my office before I walked out for the last time. Prayers uh, work. Benjamin, you asked about uh, whether or not I'm writing a book. It is, it is in the pipeline. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Elder Maraga, for that uh, talk. I just want to ask you, Elder Maraga, to elaborate on one, uh, especially when you're a young professional, there are things you pursue, you want your career to go well, you want everything else to go well. But uh, Elder Maraga, one of uh, the challenges, I think, and uh, maybe you addressed it earlier, is uh, what we call self-centeredness and selfishness, and in the light of helping others. Uh, I do not want to take you into our generation, and Elder will, will, will probably talk about it. When we were growing, we, we learned to share. So that even if I'm a young professional and there's somebody who has school fees at home, I can help. How do we manage that? Because we live in a time when it's myself, me and I. I'm a young professional, I want to live in Kilimani, I want to have a car, but I've got parents, I've got siblings, and uh, as a Christian, thank you. The question I have, I, really I want uh, at your level, would you consider that the church has done enough or needs to do something a little bit to ameliorate the burdens the young people carry? For example, would you consider starting a club or eminent persons within the church here who can probably understand within this membership how many youth we have who have finished engineering, completed engineering rather, who are lawyers, who are doctors, and practically involve yourselves or ourselves in actually pointing out that uh, we are aware ministry wants four doctors and we will try to help two of you. The reason I ask this is uh, sometimes the church as a body, and I'm not negatively critical, I'm just trying to point out that uh, sometimes the church is aloof, so that it is so interested in our spiritual well-being, but not so keen on economic well-being, so that whoever has succeeded, we conclude, yes, God has seen him through, but indeed, the one who has been left behind is just because of lack of opportunity. You have answered one question I wanted to ask about if the church prayed for you in 2017. In our small talk as lawyers, we were complaining that uh, the church did not practically come out and take a position and say, our son is doing his work and we trust in his uh, faith and stand. But anyway, now you have clarified the world prayed for you, the country prayed for you. But you may want to express yourself on that, whether you felt very much together with the church or they were scared, they also did not want to come along with you. So my main question would be, do you think the church is doing enough? Would you advise that we create a, a council within the church which can practically look at these economic, economic, uh, economic hardships? Thank you. Well, uh, I have a question. Just a small one. In the legal jurisprudence, the application of law can be looked at in two perspectives. The application can be looked at, to, I mean, to the letter or to the spirit. Which one should take the precedence? 
Uh, that question stems up from the story of Adam, I mean Abraham, when he, one time he was going to Egypt. And when he was stopped by some pirates on the way and asked whether Sarah was his wife, he cheated. And as we know, Abraham is regarded as the father of faith. Another story is the story between Esau and Jacob, whereby Jacob stole the blessings of Esau. So does it mean that where the spirit is involved, we, we, we bend the law, or the rule of law? Thank you. You mentioned about uh, the Sabbath, and maybe you are late, you have not closed your work, and maybe now the Sabbath has come. If you work that time, have you sinned? Uh, because we were in the New Testament, Jesus plugged uh, some wheat on a Sabbath day. Um, how does it uh, work in that? Uh, is it that uh, in that Sabbath now you've done a sin that cannot be forgiven? Thank you very much for these questions. I'm learning a lot from this. The first question is by Sister Mwachi. In our careers, we want to prosper in our careers. We are selfish young professionals. God has um, placed you where you are. And is looking at um, what you do. First, God wants you to be honest with him. Are you paying tight? Are you paying offerings from your income? And you know God is arithmetic, is that subtraction is what? Is what? In God is arithmetic, subtraction is what? Addition. Addition. If you are a faithful uh, tighter, I, I, I mean, I used to ask Akina Moses when they were young, when he, if you are earning 10,000 and uh, you have paid a tight of 1,000, your friend has not paid uh, uh, tight, he has 10,000, you have 9,000, who is better off? You know, when they were very young, they would say, they are, of course, the one who, is, who has 10,000 10, shillings. But as days went by, they, they realized that. When you are honest with God, 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 and I tell people, God doesn't throw money on the road for you to pick. That's not how God works. God shields you from sickness. He shields your family from sickness. He does this. So, so, so that the person who has paid tight, as a person who has paid tight, you end up being, having more money than the one who had not paid. That's how God works. Young people, we have very many people uh, surrounding us with, challenging, with challenges. Some of them can't even get food. Please don't turn uh, a blind eye to some of those things. And some of them are our relatives. I was not the first one, I was the last one myself. But I know very many first ones who were with me in university and they educated their siblings from uh, the allowance we were getting in university. From the allowance they were getting in university. And, and I mean, those people who have been educated are people who are, who are, who are proud and have come up. I know very many of our uh, friends. I have, uh, I have myself paid fees for many, many years for, 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 for children, especially of the orphans. And I thank God for that when I see them in, the, in, the, in, the, in their provisions, working. Some of them, somebody comes and tells you, look, I am now working at such and such a place. Were it not for you, I would not have been where, where I am now. Is there anything more satisfying? Even for the, for the sake of feeling that, yes, I have helped. God is going to ask at the end of the day, 
uh, whether or not you touched the lives of others who were before you. There's, there's a gentleman, before I come to Ishmael's uh, question, there's a, a gentleman who asked whether you apply, whether I have the philosophy of applying the law as it is. That's a philosophical question in law. We have two of them. We have what we call positivists. The lawyers will tell you positivists. You say, the law says this, period. And there are those who say, who, are, who have the, 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 the philosophy of realists. The law says this, but realistically, given these circumstances, how do I apply that? And by the way, that's how judges make law. Most of you sometimes don't know that judges make law, much more sometimes than even parliament. The American Constitution is a skeleton, is a skeleton. The Supreme Court of the United States has fleshed that Constitution. Our Constitution is a little more detailed, but it doesn't cover every situation. The judges have to fill in those, depending on the circumstances of each case. And if you are a judge dealing with cases like those, you think about how your judgment is going to play out, how it is going to be applied. And, uh, and, and uh, there are quite a number of, uh, of uh, cases that come. So that is, that, that's, that is uh, how you, how I, that's my philosophy in life. You have to be realistic. You know that law is not static. Law applies to particular circumstances, and you have got to interpret the law to apply to those circumstances. There is a, our sister who asked about the Sabbath. You are working on Sabbath. Something which is, which is so tempting, which is so, so tempting, if you have a shop, it is on Friday evening, People are coming at, uh, at around six, and you know that, that will happen. That will happen, and that's how the devil works. The whole day you've been sitting, and they, you don't have as many clients coming in. At six o'clock, when you're supposed to, to, wind, to begin winding up, is when the clients are, are streaming in, saying, give me this, give me this. That's where your, your challenge will come. You've got to honor God. You plan your things and say, look, no, 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 here uh, I must close. And start closing even before the sun sets. Forgo that business. Forgo that business between 6 and 6.30. In, in, here, the sun sets most of the time around 6.30. Begin closing at 6 so that you are not caught up and God will, uh, will, will reward. There is a question here that has been uh, uh, sent to me, whether I am available for uh, mentoring the upcoming Maragas. <laughs> That's something I love to do. That's something I, I am doing already. Anybody, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I have not been able the, the judiciary has taken a little long to set up my office, but it is setting up the office. I believe by the beginning of next year, I will have a full-fledged office where people can come for consultation. And, and I, will have, I will listen to young people and advise on what you, you should do. In my view, you may not agree with me, uh, but I will give my advice. And uh, that's why I, have, uh, I accept invitations, especially to uh, universities and schools. Th those are places I, I want to speak in. In fact, if, if I'm invited by students and by a church, I will go to the, to the, to the, to the invitation for students. So I, I believe I'm doing that. Elder uh, Ishmael, He's a senior lawyer, by the way. You have seen him on, uh, on TV. He's asking about what, the, what, what kind of charity, uh, charity program our church has or should have uh, to help um, the desperate people. 
we have addressed it. But address is global and it deals with emergencies. We have uh, churches, we, we have as churches, we have uh, uh, what we call, you see, the Good Samaritan uh, amount that, that we assist people who are in this situation. Yes, I agree with you, we should do something more than that. We should like set up a fund. We should like set up a fund. But that fund, uh, you don't expect, I mean, it can be, we will set it up and it can only function well if you and I get involved. It, you, you don't, that is not a fund you expect Pastor Nyaga to run. Where is the money going to come from? Where is that money going to come from? That money is going to come from, uh, uh, from us. That's a brilliant idea you have. Ishmael, I would, I, would, uh, I would ask you to champion it. Champion that, let's set up a fund and uh, give it to, to the church, uh, the money. But of course, you will set conditions on how the funds from that, uh, the amount from that fund can be applied for the very needy, needy. I mean, you don't set up a fund like that one and then you come and find uh, uh, my son Moses is the applicant for uh, <laughs> for funds from from that uh, that fund. It doesn't work like that. We must respect it. Uh, that it is the very need who, 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 who will come up. And and uh, some churches have that kind of fund. It it all depends on uh, on uh, how we give. I think that is all. I want to thank you. I don't know whether you don't know how privileged I am to address you in a gathering like this and uh, share my thoughts. Uh, the, 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 the leaders of this, uh, this uh, forum, this is great. This is great for me because we can share our failures that we don't want you people to fall into. We can share our failures so that you don't uh, fall into that uh, and, and, uh, and share our experiences that can help you. So I want to thank you most sincerely. I don't know what you have, how you want us to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elder Maraga. Let's say a big amen to our elder. Amen. Yeah, we want to thank you very much for the kind words, for the insights, and it's not in vain. I just want to leave you with this text from the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So in our practice, we look to Jesus Christ, who is our greatest advocate. Amen? Good. At this point, I want to welcome my brother. And let me find out, is there any other person who is a potential Adventist? And my brother, just come. Kindly, we have a gift for you which we'll receive from our speaker, Elder David uh, Maraga. Is there anyone who falls in that category, maybe who missed out when I was doing the introduction? Please, Karibu, and we are very much honored to have you. We have a, a present, a small token of appreciation, just to encourage you to visit one, one more time, and I hope you have been blessed. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. What's your name? Elvis Koech. Koech? Yeah. Great. May God bless you. We have a present for you. This is, you saw the, the, the speaker who was here, Mark Finlay. Yeah. This is great. Please go and read it. It will, it will uplift you. I've read through it. I know what it does. May God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Please come again. Thank you. Yes. As I call upon Elder, and mom to come. I want the three advocates to come and gift uh, our speaker for the day. I know right. rarely when you approach court you get instructions from the bench, but now let the bar gift the bench. So please let's come when as we gift uh, mom kindly Moses. I know you are part of the department, but now put on another robe and be part of the family. Please come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Karibu, karibu sana. Thank you. Ah. Lumumba. Just a small token of appreciation for the time, effort, the wise words. It is to the family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, before I pray, I want to appreciate the youngest prof, uh, professional here, um, uh, Elder Care. <laughs> uh, you know, I saw him seated. <laughs> He's called a young professional. I thought, this is the youngest. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Elder, you know, for sitting all... Uh, this while supporting our young people, it means a lot. It means a lot. We can stand for prayer. We thank you, gracious Father in heaven, for the privilege of this fellowship this evening, young professionals. I thank you for creating us and equipping us. Lord, the uh, people here, who are thanking you for the blessings of opportunities in this life. Receive their thanksgiving. There are professionals here, Lord, who are praying and hoping a door of hope to be opened. Somebody has been working every day and dropping applications here and there, this interview and that interview, but something has not come through. They are still hanging on in faith. Lord, I pray that you will grant them the request of their hearts. There are professionals here who are in school. They are going through that training. And they are aspiring to be great personalities in the days to come. Lord, all these people here, in the adornments of various gifts and talents and skills that they have attained from the trainings, I pray that they will find a way of using this in your service. When you called Moses, you asked him, what do you have? He said, I have a staff in my hand. And you told him to go to Egypt to deliver your people using that staff. But today we recognize that that staff was a symbol of Moses' profession because he was a shepherd. And so the doctors were here, the lawyers were here, the teachers were here, the engineers were here, all these professionals just are staff in our hands to serve you and to deliver your people. May we find in your vineyard a space for us, Lord, to minister, to serve in hospitals, in courtrooms, in the streets, in various offices representing you that you may continue blessing us and preparing us for eternity. As you dismiss going home, Lord, we pray that as you turn a new week, Lord, may your blessings accompany us as we go back to our offices. May the people that work with us, our colleagues there, find something special and unique in us. That is the presence of Jesus in our lives. May we stand to be counted. May we fear nothing. But every day, walk reverently before you, knowing that after everything has been done and said, yonder when you come, and when names will be read, that our names will be found in the number. Dismiss us with your blessings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.